ado, let me introduce our alum. Kathy Kamitis is a New Orleans-based artist and designer who sold her first watercolor at the age of 10. As a daughter of veterinarians, Kathy expresses her family's lifelong love of animals through her meticulous, lifelike paintings. She earned a BA from Loyola University in 2011, and today, at age 34, runs her <coughs> multifaceted business, Cat Art and Designs from Home. When clients learn that Catherine has brutal bone disease, they are captivated by her unique perspective. She and her parents stopped counting her broken bones at 500 at the age of 10. She's two feet seven inches tall, gets around on an electric wheelchair, and creates all of her art, jewelry, and commercial graphic design by lying on her side. To learn more about Catherine, pick up a copy of her book, Looking Up, on her website or Amazon or here today. Okay. Raise your hand if you've ever broken a bone. Who's broken a bone? Ooh, that's a good number of you. Okay. It hurts, right? Everybody's broken a bone. It, it's painful. What if I told you that by 10 years old, I had broken over 500 bones? I had broken so many by that point that my parents and I just stopped counting. Oh. Hold on, we're having a technical problem. This is not working. Is it on? It says it's on. One second. It worked just fine. I'm gonna, but this is me, I did that. So. Okay, there we go, okay. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. So I am here today to tell you a little bit about my story in the hopes that it helps you continue your story in a way that's not only meaningful to you, but also to those around you. I truly believe that everyone has something to give, something they can share with society. But the problem is that everyone has to figure out what their something is and then do it. And that doing it part, there we go, that doing it part is key. So think about those you look up to. Maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a teacher, maybe it's a celebrity, someone who had an impact on you along the way. Why do you look up to that person? You look up to that person because they did something that impacted your life. You can be the smartest person in the world or the most talented artist or graphic designer on the planet, but unless you do something with that brain and that talent, it really doesn't matter. My name is Catherine Colmitis, as Danielle said, and I am an artist and graphic designer. I have a genetic bone disease called osteogenesis imperfecta, also called OI for short, and it basically causes my bones to grow abnormally and to break easily. I am obviously two foot seven in height, and I get around with the assistance of this electric wheelchair and my aid. Although OI does affect my entire life, literally every aspect of it, and I did have to grow up a little bit differently, my parents made sure that I got to take part in as many normal kid activities as possible. I went to a mainstream grade school and high school and college here at Loyola, and I participated in as many regular kid activities with my friends as I could. I graduated from here in 2011, summa cum laude, and I had a BA in graphic design. And today I run my own design business from my house. So discovering my something, who had one of these when they were growing up? Of course, right? We all had this. When I was young, my parents were constantly trying to find things that I could do that would keep me busy because I was smart and I was driving them completely insane. 
At five years old, my mom gave me one of these. She gave me my first watercolor set. And we all know, right? They're super cheap. They barely make a mark on the paper. The brush is plastic. I mean, it's basically a piece of crap, right? But I blew through it in one week and we had no computer paper left in the house by the time I was done. It was clear at that point that I was hooked and art would be my something. And it turned out that I was actually pretty good at it. My parents made sure that I was uh, that I was exposed to as much of the art world as I could be at a young age. I had art in school, of course, but then I also had private art lessons and summer art camps. We all did summer art camps, right? Right, okay. I got to gain experience in all types of media, acrylic, watercolor, printmaking. I even got to do some glass blowing one summer, which was super fun, but really, really hot. <laughs> But watercolor became my true love. Oh, there we go. Okay. Growing up with two parents who were veterinarians, it is no surprise that my favorite subject matter was, and still is, animals of all kinds. I sold my first painting, which was of a bunch of dogs, when I was 10. And pretty soon after that, I started painting my parents' clientele while I was bored at their office. So I would just sit in the waiting room and while people were waiting to see my parents, I would paint their dogs. And slowly but surely, people actually started paying me for it. And so I was 12 years old making 20 or 40 bucks for a painting that I did in 20 or 30 minutes and that was pretty awesome. My friends were not doing that. But along my art journey, I had a few amazing mentors and they helped me develop my skills and my process and my style. I found that it's easier for me to paint while I'm lying on my side because A, it's easier on my back. I don't have to sit up and hold myself straight. And B, I can rest my arm on my side while I paint and it lets me paint for longer periods of time. The problem with that is that the world looks really different when you're laying on your side than when you're sitting straight up. Has anybody tried to draw while they're laying on their side? Have you picked it up after and been like, oh God, what happened? Yeah, try it. Because what looks straight when you're laying down is not going to look straight when you pick it back up. I had a mentor when I was, uh, I guess, a teenager named Robin, who taught at Delgado, and she taught me private art classes. And she would actually lay on the floor with me on the weekends and help me learn how to compensate for my angle. So she would see the world as I saw it. And she made me practice drawing straight lines without a ruler. Who in here has done that? Everybody here has done that. Circles without a compass, yes, over and over and over and over and over. And I pretty much hated it, right? We all hated that. Yeah, but it turns out that all of that hard work paid off. Because I know that without Robin's lessons, I would not be able to draw or be the artist I am today. And in between those technical lessons, Robin taught me some life lessons along the way. I can still hear her telling me, draw what you see, not what you think you see. Anybody heard that one in here? Yep. And that a good painting begins with a good drawing. She taught me that life is not always as it seems at first glance. And sometimes, we need to look again before we make a judgment. She also taught me that, and I'm sure everybody in here has learned this, you have to do the grunt work if you want to be successful in anything. So while my friends were off perfecting their sports moves, I was in my studio drawing circle after circle and line after line, 
And I learned that art isn't always fun, but nothing really worth doing in life is always fun, is it? I worked hard and it paid off. Although art started as a hobby for me, literally just something to keep me busy, it soon turned into a passion and eventually a source of income. Art gave me something to share with society that made other people happy, but it also gave me a way of earning a living even though I had some pretty significant physical challenges. I found that while there are a lot of jobs I can't do, I can create art and I can do graphic design and I can earn just as much or more money than my able-bodied friends do. In this way, art gave me a sense of independence and a sense of hope in life that I never had before. My grandparents started hosting art and jewelry parties for me when I was about 15 in where they live in New Iberia, Louisiana, which is a very small town about two hours from here. And later I built my business model around that. We call them cat art parties where I bring all of my art into somebody's home or into like a place of business or a church or somewhere like that. And we have a party. So instead of, does, have anybody been to like a um, Avon party? That's really old, but LuLaRue or um, Tupperware parties or anything like that. Okay, I know, I'm sorry. I don't do these things very often for anybody else but myself. Um, but, but, Basically, it's the same thing. So the host will get a portion of the proceeds I make, and usually they take it in merchandise. And then I get to meet a bunch of people, and it's really fun. We have a great time. And so even though art is not something I would necessarily say I do for fun anymore, it's opened up more opportunities for me than I could have ever imagined as that five-year-old with that super cheap watercolor set. As I approached the end of high school, I had to really start thinking about what my next steps were gonna be because I knew I was gonna become a professional artist, I just didn't know exactly how. Leaving home for college was physically not an option as much as I really wanted to try to go to an art school, it just wasn't an option. So. I toured UNO, Tulane, and Loyola. And as luck would have it, the day I toured UNO, these skies just opened up and it poured and it flooded and I couldn't get around the campus. And having an electric wheelchair in a rainstorm in, on a campus where it floods is not a good situation. So as much as I liked it and as much as it would have been the easier financial decision for my family, that was out. The next up was Tulane. I got about halfway through Tulane's tour when I said I cannot handle these sidewalks because they are so broken up and the campus is so spread out. It's beautiful, but it's so spread out that it was going to be almost impossible for me to get around. I looked at my dad, I remember looking at my dad halfway through and saying, there is no way I'm doing this every day for the rest of my next four years. There's no way. And at that point, we turned around and went home. And although some of the sidewalks at Loyola are not the best, I will, I will vouch for that. Although I gotta say, today, they've, they've done a lot in the last 10 years. But it's definitely better. It was obvious how much more manageable this campus would be like, immediately. The school was also willing to work with me as far as putting my classes in places where I didn't have to walk across campus very much, and that was very helpful. And at the time, <laughs> none of you are probably gonna remember this except Callie probably, and Daniela and everybody who was here before, the art building was less to be desired 
okay? It needed some serious TLC, maybe a bulldozer at that point. I don't know, it was really bad. Um, but the program was fabulous and the professors were great. And I started classes here as a fine arts major in 2007. I had come from an extremely rigorous high school. And academically, the first few years of Loyola were kind of a breeze for me, except for the art classes. Although I had taken all these art classes privately, professors were now asking me to think in ways that I had never had to think before. They were asking me to create like on demand, and that was really, really hard. There we go. For example, I remember in Fundamentals 2, which does that even exist anymore? No. Okay, well, there was a class called, there was Fundamentals 1 and Fundamentals 2, and you learned about all the basics of art, like uh, composition and value and all those things. Anyway, I remember in Fundamentals 2, we were given a huge piece of styrofoam. Did you make a light switch, Callie? Yeah, okay, I remember that. Anyway, we were given this huge piece of styrofoam, and we were told to create something that showed juxtaposition. And we had to use 95% of the styrofoam, and we had to stack it and glue it and carve it and create something that showed juxtaposition. That was like, I think that was our only guideline. Yeah. And so I created this fish that was not only a juxtaposition of color, because it used warm and cool colors, but it was also basically a fish out of water, right? So I, used, I did it in a few ways. And this is still in my bathroom today, and I probably could have sold it eight times over, because I've had so many people say, oh, how much is that? I'm like, that's a school project. That's not for sale. But the funniest thing about this project was that I killed my dad's turkey carving knife while creating it, and I had to buy him a new one. That was, that was kind of sad. But as I moved through my first year, and I realized how much art I would have to physically produce to be a fine artist, I knew like this would never work because there are a lot of days where I can't get up and paint, where I have pain levels where I can't do that. And as a fine artist, that just can't happen. At least not until I come up with something as good as the blue drug and I get famous like George Rodri did, but I'm still working on that. That has not happened yet. So at the beginning of my sophomore year, I decided to switch my major from fine art to design. And what was great was all the prereqs were the same at that time for both, uh, both majors. And so I wasn't behind at all, which was fabulous. I figured that most graphic design was done on a computer. So even on the days where I couldn't move a whole lot, I would probably still be able to work for the most part, at least, at least some. What's funny is, I thought when I started in graphic design that I wanted to go into web design. And then Daniela assigned us our first Dreamweaver project. And I had to make a rollover work. And I said, nope, never again. This will get contracted out. And it is. I still contract out web at, to this day. I just knew that HTML was not a language I was ever going to speak. And so it, it just, I, I wrote that off pretty quickly. But I did learn that I really liked print design. And I liked that all of those things I learned, painting, composition, and value, and layering, all of those things could be applied to print design. Recognize a few of those? Yeah. <laughs> I liked the idea of creating something tangible, something useful. I liked the idea of creating brand strategies, a way to represent a business visually. And I liked the idea of playing with type and making type into images. I thought that was really fun. And I turned out to be pretty good with the pen tool after this horrible project that Daniela made us do. And 
So tracing and drawing with Illustrator, I was actually OK. All of that said, it's no wonder that I chose to create books for my, both my junior and senior vinyl design projects, which we can pass some of these around if you guys want to. Um, I'm going to talk about the Flamingo one first. My junior project was called Flamingo, like, you know, G-A-U-X, because we're fancy like that down here. And it was basically just a lot of fun. My friend had given me two lawn flamingos when the lawn, there was like some lawn flamingo craze that came out. And anyway, she wanted me to decorate them as her two favorite Saints players at the time, which was Drew Brees and I don't remember who the other one was. But anyway, she, um, she gave them to me eventually. And I was like, what am I going to do with these? I'm not even really that into football. Like, what am I going to do with these flamingos? Well, I don't remember what the prompt was for this project, but somehow from the prompt, I decided I was going to take these two flamingos all over New Orleans and do a day in their life, do a timeline book of a day in their life. And basically, they went everywhere. They got beignets, they got their fortunes read, they, got, they went to St. Louis Cathedral, they went to a bar, um, they got up in the morning, they brushed their teeth, they, I mean, like everything. They went to bed. Oh, they went and fed the ducks. That was hilarious because the ducks were terrified of these flamingos. It was, it was hysterical. We had a really hard time getting those pictures. But anyway, so I put uh, these two books together. Um, one is kind of a revision of the first one. And then I combined all of those pictures with facts about flamingos. <coughs> So is this a useful project? Probably not. I mean, unless you want to learn everything there is to know about flamingos, probably not. But it was a lot of fun, and I learned a lot about putting a book together and actually publishing a hardback book and what that took. My senior thesis, looking up, is a coffee table book all about me and my perspective. So at the beginning of, and I'm not sure if it works the same way now, but at the beginning of our senior year, Daniela told us, and Tom told us, that we would have to do a project throughout the next two semesters that would be in a show at the end of the year that we would have to put together as a class. And when we asked them for guidance, the only guidance we got was, Create something only you can create. Great. <laughs> so we had Christmas break to come up with three ideas to present to them when we got back in January. And I honestly don't remember what my other two ideas were. I think one was a poster project, but I'm not sure. But this is the direction I decided to go in. At first, we thought it would be hilarious if I did an oversized book, something that was literally the size of me, because, you know, that would be really funny, right? Well, it was hilarious. Right up until the time I started looking at printing costs for an oversized book. Scratch that plan. Slowly, my project evolved into this coffee table book, and an accompanying loop video I did like a day in my life, video during the show, and it went really well. After graduation, Arthur Hardy, does everybody know who Arthur Hardy is in this room? He's Mr. Mardi Gras. You see him on, I think it's WDSU. I'm not sure which one, but he's the guy with the mustache and the Mardi Gras bow tie. Anyway, he picked it up and published it, and it's available in a few local bookstores as well as on Amazon and here with me. So when I graduated in 2011, I immediately began to freelance. I started working for the New Orleans Musicians Clinic, which I still work for today. And I picked up literally any job I could possibly find. <coughs> and, you know, I did discounted work. I did free work. I did work that's not fun. 
for a long time. I still do work that's not fun sometimes. You do what you have to do. But little by little, I got my name out there and I started getting more clients by word of mouth. And I started having to learn how to juggle all of these clients and all of these projects and their demands. And let me tell you, if you think this lady's tough, you just wait until you have a week like I had last week where one nonprofit has an event at the end of the week, one nonprofit had an event the next day and sponsors got left off banners and they all need all of this stuff fixed all at the same time. It is not easy. And they all think they're the center of your attention 24 seven. So if you think it's bad now, it, it doesn't get a whole lot better. I hate to tell you, but you're working for yourself and it should feel fulfilling, right? Slowly but surely, after I graduated, I got out of school mode and I got into like a working lifestyle. I started wanting to paint again. And I remember the first painting I did after college. It's called Identity and it's still one of my favorites and it hangs in my kitchen. It's funny because I look back on my years at Loyola and I really didn't paint much while I was here except for what I had to do for class because there was, we had so much being asked of us, right? You feel like what you're doing is everything you can just to keep up in class, right? That I didn't have it in me to paint. I didn't want to paint. But slowly but surely, I started to miss it. And so my free time in between clients, I do a pet portrait here and there, which is not something I was doing at that time. I would paint a bird. I would, you know, paint whatever I felt like. And I started to remember how much I loved it. So identity gave Nicole, my aid and I, this idea that we could create a greeting card pack based on all of those eyeballs. So it would be a pack of 12 cards and we would sell them at my art and jewelry shows, but I was still doing with my grandparents every year. And then the more I painted, the more greeting cards got added to the collection. And then we had to break them up and then people wanted special requests. And it was just a kind of a nightmare. But I started seeing other ways I could use my art. So but before we knew it, I had mugs and I had towels and I had blankets and I had ornaments. I had an entire homeware line basically that I was selling at all of these events I was doing. So still today, I'm constantly looking at different products and testing out things and seeing what works and what doesn't. And I'm always honing my skills and working on my marketing strategies. But a huge part of why I can do that is because I have a design background. That's a huge part of it. So today I do a combination of art and graphic design. My business is kind of split down the middle, down in two. I have several design clients, mostly nonprofits, uh, which I do print design and social media management for. And this, uh, I also do pet portraits still, of course. And I, this will be the third year I have a collection of new paintings in a museum in Louisiana. So that's really exciting. That's gonna open in September in Thibodeau. So if y'all sign up for my list, you'll get the email. It'll be exciting. Everybody come. But having all of these facets of my business keeps my interest because I get bored really easily. And it helps me to not get bored and to not burn out because everybody here, I'm sure, has had burnout, right? We all had it. it it's just, it's a thing. It totally happens. It is hard sometimes to juggle both sides of my business. And even recently, because I have this big painting deadline for September, 
which is really July, but I'm going to try not to think about that right now. Um, <laughs> I Even recently, I've had to change my schedule. I've had to say, no, I'm not working for clients on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I am only painting on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And most of the time, I can hold it to that. Not always, but most of the time. Um, but that's, it's hard to say no sometimes. But my favorite projects are still the ones where I get to combine art and design. So this project is called Breed All About Us, and it's floating around, it's coming around. Um, this was a collaboration I did with my neighbor in 2019. And it features 64 dog breeds, and I painted each one of the 64. So there's a kind of like a mini pet portrait of each one in there. And then my neighbor, Yvonne, wrote a little quip to go along with each painting. And it teaches you about what it's like to own the breed. And it's not, it's not like a typical breed book where it says the breed and how old the breed is and you know short hair, long hair. None of, it does, it's not like that. We actually interviewed people who own these types of dogs and got stories from them about their dogs and wrote the book based off of that. And of course, we do have some other factual information in there too. But, you know, it's funnier when the, the story about the St. Bernard is about how the lady came home and the dog had eaten her couch, right? I mean, that, that definitely keeps your attention a little more than, you know, it's from whatever country and, you know, factual stuff. This was actually, I actually published this book. I self-published it in 2019. Unfortunately, right before the pandemic struck and we were doing really well. We had uh, book signings. We were doing book signings at all the Barnes and Nobles and all the small book, book shops. And then we were doing stuff at pet stores and it was, it was going really, really well. And then everything kind of shut down. And so it's, it kind of picked back up now, um, but I wonder, I always wonder like how well this book would have done had that not happened, because it was, it was really fun to put together, and you know, it, it would have been nice if it had done a little bit better, but that's okay. I, it, I still love it. But art has been my something for as long as I can remember, but now design is too. When you find your something or your purpose, then it's easier to deal with all the bad stuff and create the good because you already have a reason to live, right? Do y'all find that whatever else is going on in your life, you can at least dive into your schoolwork or, or your art or whatever it is you're passionate about. It gives you a structure, a focal point, something to build your life around. When bad things happen, your something will always be there to help you move forward. It's what gives your life purpose and meaning. And everyone has something. Everyone has something to contribute to society. But the trick is finding it. What's that one thing that makes you tick? Is it painting? Is it graphic design? Is it sculpture? Is it creating something? Are you happiest when you're sharing your talent with others? Then you're probably in the right place. I found that perseverance plus passion equals success and satisfaction. Finding my something in art not only gave me a career, but it gave my life purpose and meaning. I know how hard this program is, but it's worth it. When Daniela is telling you to draw a two inch by two inch square 3,000 times by tomorrow at 8 a.m., or when you're fighting with After Effects, or you're pulling an all-nighter to meet a ridiculous deadline, or you're selling an organ to pay for your latest print project at Kinko's, 
because we've all done it. I promise it's all worth it in the end. You're learning a skill here, but you're also learning a lot of life lessons that you don't even realize you're learning right now. And with a little bit of luck and a lot of hard work, maybe art and design can be your something too. And maybe you'll be up here sharing it with all of us in a few years. Thank you very much. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take questions. I have really bad hearing. Uh, that's kind of part of my whole OI deal. So Nicole is going to come up here and repeat them back to me so that I can hear them because I am not going to be able to hear any of you. Don't be scared. I don't bite. You can ask me whatever. Okay. Um, first, thank you. That was great. I'm glad that I came. <laughs> Okay, I, I did hear her. That was good. Um, uh, so, uh, funny you should ask that. I um, did not re-up re my inventory. Yeah, she can have that. I did not re-up my inventory yet this year. They are on order. So if you order it through my Etsy store, um, I should have them by the first, and then they'll get to you. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yep. Yeah, I realized that the other day. Or email, huh? Yeah, or you can email me. Either way. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You said you don't do art, like you don't consider art something you do for fun anymore. I find that that kind of happens the more I'm designing and aiming for a deadline, the more I like don't want to do art. How do you manage to like balance that and still find joy in it and not like rotate something else? I haven't got that. Okay. <laughs> so you say art isn't really fun anymore, it's work. How do you balance it to make it? Because she just feels like she doesn't want to do it anymore. Cause... Oh, I've been there. I know what that feels like. Um, so, okay, I said art isn't fun anymore. It, it is when it's what I want to be painting. And unfortunately, you guys are in a position right now where you don't get to do that. And um, I know. I, it's, it can be really frustrating. Um, I do pet portraits, and those feel like work every single time. Because the thing with a pet portrait is, it has to look like that dog, right? Or that cat, or that bird, or that horse, whatever it is. And so it's, it's stressful, right? Because all of, we have pets, right? There, people here have pets. There are babies, right? So like if you're commissioning a pet portrait, you want it to look like your dog. Right? Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot more pressure with those. Now I'm also doing a series right now of all Louisiana wildlife, and that's for my show in September. And it's going really well, and I'm getting to choose what I paint for that show. So it's stressful in that I have a deadline, but it's not as stressful in that I'm at least getting to choose what I want to paint, and I'm getting to I get to pick what photos inspire me and what I get to use and how I want the show to come together. And change it up between Yeah, and like that's the nice feathers. That's the so I just did a show. I should have put these up here, but I just did a show of fish, of all tropical fish, and it was thirty five paintings. I don't want to paint another fish right now. <laughs> okay? Like that was a lot of fish. And as fun as they were, that was a lot of fish. But what's nice about Louisiana animals is there's all kinds of Louisiana animals. Yeah. I mean, I can go everything from a cockroach to a bobcat to a raccoon to a, a redfish to, you know, an egret, which is great. So and, the year before that, it was birds, so. Right, so I didn't want to paint another bird again for a long time. <laughs> you know, but so yeah, if you, if you can get to a point where you can switch it up like that and you can balance, um, that really, really helps. But like I said, it's gonna be a little bit before you get to that point. But you'll get there. You'll get there eventually. Yep. So you mentioned like right now the school you kind of started doing some freelance work and that was your like professional end. I'm just kind of wondering like how you went about finding that work. Um, I assume it probably wasn't easy. 
the freelance work after college? How did you go about finding it? <laughs> um, it, it wasn't easy. <laughs> no, it's not easy. Um, it's, it's, it's talking to people. I mean, first it's talking to people. So some of the freelance work I found was actually from our design show, actually from our senior show. Um, I know a lot of people got jobs from our senior show. So that was, that was really good. Um, it, if you get one job, it's easier to get more. That's what I found. And if you work really hard for one client and you make yourself kind of invaluable to them, they will recommend you over and over and over. And so it, it just, it takes time. I mean, I did not get to a point where I felt like I was making any kind of money for at least four or five years. I mean, it was a while. It doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. Um, but I'm actually at a point now where I can refuse clients, which is kind of nice. Um, and that, that was probably within the last two or three years I got to that point. So it, it, takes, it takes time. But word of mouth, I did some of those websites, those freelance websites where you go on, but it's, it's so hard, especially now with AI, because I feel like everybody wants something for really, 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 really cheap or nothing. And it's, it's not, those websites never worked well for me. I, had, I got one client off of those websites that I kept for a long time out of maybe 30. So, yeah. So you also may want to um, just explain the two projects you sent around. Like oh, the projects? And, yeah, so sure. So the swatch book, which is that green thing going around, <clears throat> which I've already given Daniela a hard time about today. Um, yeah, so that project, which apparently none of you are lucky enough to do anymore, um, you we had to find items and take a two by two square and trace, right, trace the pattern and then by hand and draw it by hand and then we had to scan those and then trace that with the pen tool in Illustrator. And there's like 200 of these squares or something in this stupid book, right? Yeah, I mean, it was torture. It was torture. But, and, and, but I was really good at the pencil by the end of it. That is one way to learn. Um, and then the raindrop book, I don't remember the prompt for that, but we had to make a book that was something about like a sound or something, and I don't remember exactly what the prompt was, but it's a book all about rain, and it's waterproof, so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and then I talked about the Flamingo book. I think that might be all I sent around. And we did look it up, too. Oh, and, and yeah, I talked we about looking talked about up. about the rest. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I want a question. Um, so with, can you talk about your experience with Adobe? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not sure. yeah. Yeah, so a couple of years ago, um, has any, anybody watched the Adobe Max conference in here? Okay, so a couple of years ago, I got an email on like a Monday morning from some woman at Adobe Max, and it said, hey, we're going to be in your area on Thursday. We need to film somebody. Um, this is Adobe Max. We'd love to feature you at our virtual conference this year. And I think this was like 2000, and, it was after COVID started. So I think it was 2001, maybe, I think, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, we'd love to come and we're coming in from LA. And so, okay, I get this email and I'm like, this is a load of crap. There is no way, this, there is no way. Like, why would they choose me? Like first, and how would they even find me? Like, this is Adobe, right? It was not spam. It was totally true. Apparently, Adobe Max that year, were, they were featuring, like to deal with the pandemic, they were featuring all of these artists from all over the world in all different media. So they had dance and design and painting and sculpture and all kinds of stuff. And so in between each workshop, they would run these 10 minute features on different artists. 
and I ended up being one of them. And they paid you to come into your home and, or your studio or whatever, you know, wherever you were, and film you. And they, they told me, it's only going to be about six hours. Yeah. Okay. So they got to my house at 1030 in the morning and they left at like 915 that night. Um, and we filmed all day. It was two huge cameras, like two professional huge cameras, huge lights. They moved all of our furniture. Like it was, it was crazy. And like, I couldn't believe I walked into it. It just, they, I asked them where they found me and they said, Google. So I guess my SEO is working. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. Um, but it was crazy. And I said, well, why, why is this so last minute? Cause you know, you would think that this is something they would plan out, right? And they said, well, somebody dropped out at the last minute and we're gonna have all of our crew in New Orleans. So we needed to find somebody in New Orleans. And I was like, I mean, did they die? Like, why would you give up this opportunity? I mean, this is crazy. I mean, not only do you get paid for it, you get exposure that's insane, you know? So it was, it was great. It was a really cool experience. Um, my Instagram following went way up after that. That was very exciting. But yeah, it was, it was crazy. Ask Nicole, it was a very long day. It was a very, but they brought in catering. Walking up and down the driveway. Oh yeah, because everything you do, you have to do it like 15 times for the camera. And then they'd like take the camera and do all this stuff in your face to get like the lighting effects. And it was, they it was nuts. Feeding the dogs, I'm like, okay. Yeah. It was crazy. Can you, can you still see it? Can you Google it? Say again. What? Can you still Google it and see yeah, it? Yeah, I think so. Well, it's on my YouTube. So you can go to my YouTube and see it. Okay. If they, because I think maybe they took it down after a year, but I ripped it off. So it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they paid you well. Yes. Like, like I didn't even ask, because I remember like when they approached me, I was like, okay, well, how much do I have to pay for this? You know, because I'm thinking, man, this is great exposure. I mean, maybe I should go ahead and do it. But what if they want, you know, a lot of money? I don't have a lot, especially with COVID going on. You know, I'm not making any money right now. So how am I going to pay for this? And they're like, oh, no, no. The, the fee for us, you know, we pay you this much. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh, that'll, they're like, is that okay? I'm like, yeah, yeah, that'll work. I'm good with that. <laughs> the other thing you can mention is your experience with Rod Stewart. Oh, yeah. I didn't talk about Rod Stewart, did I? Do you want to pull that up on my website or not? Sure. Yeah. Okay. It's better when you can see it. So, this, okay. Y'all are young. Who in here knows who Rod Stewart is? Okay, good. Okay, there's hope for this world. Okay. So, a few years ago, uh, actually, like almost five years ago, um, I went to Jazz Fest and Rod Stewart was there. And my friend and I basically camped out the whole day, got a good spot, you know, tried to sing all of his songs back to him, which I didn't really know all of at the time. So I kind of faked it the whole time. But apparently, I did a really good job because he kept looking at me and singing to me. And I'm like, okay, I don't really know this song, but I'm going to move my mouth and hopefully it looks right. And, um, and he, uh, he, get, he kicks out these soccer balls at every show that he signs. So he gives me one of his soccer balls, which was awesome. And then during his like, second to last song, yeah, go to design, graphic design. Um, his second to last song, he uh, is like, do you want to come backstage? Like he points at me and my friend, he's like, y'all, y'all want to come backstage? And I'm like, what? Me? Who? Okay. So we, and long story short, we end up backstage and we're talking to him, his family, his band, like having a glass of wine. I mean, it was crazy. And my friend kind of jokingly told him that I was a graphic designer and that I like to design for the music industry, which is true. I love music. I love live music. And I love designing for the music industry. And he's like, oh, well, you want to have a go at my next album cover? And I'm like, 
okay. <laughs> like, and, and at that point, I was still thinking, this is never gonna happen, right? I mean, why would Rod Stewart hire me to work on his album art? Anyway, his, I, he asked his manager to get my information, which she did, and she said she was gonna email me the next week with the specs and all the, all the details and whatever. And I'm like, okay, we'll see. And she did, like she totally did. And over the next three months, I worked with her, well, I worked with him through her on album art. <clears throat> and let me tell you, working with a celebrity is extremely stressful because he's Rod Stewart, right? So I'd send stuff in. I'd send in like, you know, six design directions and I wouldn't hear anything for two weeks. And so I'm sitting there going, he hates it. I failed, I failed Rod Stewart. Like, how did I do this? This is horrible. I, I didn't sleep, like it was awful. <laughs> and then I'd get a message from his manager and she'd say, oh, Rod's been on holiday. I'm like, oh, great, great for him. Okay, well, what did he say? You know, and then I'd get like one sentence. Well, I want my face in it, but not like that. That's it, like that is all I would get from him, and I'm like, okay. So anyway, I did not get the album cover. He came down to two, that last one, and then somebody else's, and um, he it picked. It ended up being like an abstract thing. I yeah, think. it's weird. It's nothing like he normally chooses. I'm convinced his, uh, his record label picked it. I don't know, but anyway, um, he still paid me. I still got a check from Rod Stewart, yeah. which is pretty awesome. He told her to send the bill. She's like, how do I charge? I know. I'm like, how do I charge? Because by that, at that point, I wasn't, I still wasn't really charging as a full designer. Like, I still was like, you know, $30, $40 an hour. And I'm like, what do I charge Rod Stewart? Like, I don't, I don't want to rip him off, but I also don't want him to think like, I'm a quack. I mean, like, what do I do? So, yeah. So, anyway. I went a middle middle range, middle road, but um, it was it was good. It was an incredible experience, and I still get to get free tickets to his shows, which is awesome. We went and hung out with, out with him in Las Vegas, <clears throat> so it's cool. Any other questions? Anything else? I can't see. Okay. What do you um, advise with somebody suffering? She has arthritis, so like chronic pain for motivation, to motivate yourself. I was gonna say, are we talking medications or motivation? Because <laughs> I could go both ways. Um, okay. <laughs> um, um, well, I really like music. So music helps me a lot. So uh, you can ask Nicole when like, I have a headache or I'm overwhelmed or I'm really hurting, I'm like, I'm putting on my headphones. Leave me alone. You know, or when, if she doesn't want it in her head, yeah. I have to listen to it. It's rare though. Usually it's in my head. But um, you know, so I put on my headphones, I put on music really loud, and that helps me to like take my mind off of what's going on. Um, I mean, sometimes just throwing myself into work helps me a lot. Uh, I had a really bad injury in September and Part of the biggest, I mean, for me, like mentally, part of the biggest problem was that I couldn't work for like five weeks, which was really hard. Um, I mean, financially, it was not great either, but, um, you know, just mentally, I'm used to constantly working, you know, so on something, whether it's painting or design or whatever. And so, um, yeah, throwing myself into work usually really helps. And I used to do that when I was like in school too, when I was in even grade school. I hated not going to school. My mom, you know, at, I'm sure many of you have wanted to be sick, right, at school. I never wanted that. Like I always wanted to go to school. And um, my mom would have to make me stay home. She'd be like, no, you have two broken bones. You have to stay home today. You know, and I never wanted to do that. So. I'm weird, I don't know. 
I come from two very highly motivated parents. Well, it so. makes you think about paying more. Just <coughs> it does. At home. It does. If you work through it, you know, that, that seems to help. But I get, too, that there are days you can't do that. And that's okay. I mean, that's, that's totally okay when there are days you can't do that. Anybody else? Anybody, oh, yeah. What type of music do you listen to? <laughs> Depends on if it's in her head or out. Yeah, because she doesn't like country music nearly as much as I do. Um, it depends. It depends on my mood. Um, I grew up on country music, so I love 90s country. That's like my go-to old school. But I also love 90s pop, and I love 80s, and I love 70s because I grew up if listening it's me, to... it's Vanilla Ice. Yes, sometimes. Um, you know, I grew up listening to what my parents listened to. So I listened to Elton John and Billy Joel and all the classics too. Um, the only thing I really can't stand is classical music, which sounds terrible, but only because I can't sing to it. Or there's, you know, like I need that, the lyric to like, to distract me. Um, that's the other thing is when I paint, I have to have either music or TV on in the background. I can't just paint. <clears throat> there has to be something else because otherwise I get really frustrated. I have to have like, I guess, whatever part of my brain distracted. Yeah, I'll go out and smoke, take a smoke break. I come <laughs> in and she screams at the top of her life. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> She's singing. I can't sing, okay? <laughs> <laughs> So if I, if I am singing, it's because I think there's nobody else in the house, right? But then I don't hear her come in, and then we have problems. But it's okay. It's okay. So with the photography that you use in your school projects, do you still use photography for your design and work? Photography, you used it for your school work. Do you, you still use it for your web design? And I don't personally do it myself. Um, I do know Lightroom. Like, I mean, I've, I've learned it. I've, believe it or not, taken a class since I graduated to learn it because we didn't get taught Lightroom in school. Um, but I, uh, I mean, I could do it. I just don't. It, it's hard for me to hold a camera. So, uh, you know, physically, that's not the best medium for me. But I use it I use other people's photography to get inspired for my paintings. So um, there's a news anchor, John Snell, I don't know if any of you know him, but he does incredible bird and Louisiana wildlife photography, like beautiful pictures. And I've asked him if I can use his photos. So a lot of what I'm doing right now is based off of his photos. Um, and then, you know, I use, I go on and find stock photos and things that I'm not gonna get in trouble for later for copyright. Um, but so yeah, in that way I use it. Um, and of course I use it, you know, to, to promote my items, to promote my homeware stuff. You know, I have like a little background at home where I put the mug or whatever and take a picture and post it on Etsy or wherever it is I'm posting it. But that's not really photography. I mean, that's just me taking a picture to put, to sell something, you know. So yeah, not in the formal way. Anybody else? Thank you. No? No? Okay. Yeah? Okay. <clears throat>